Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to announce, uh, to introduce rather our first keynote speaker for this evening. For most of you present here, I think Avita Krishnan requires very little introduction. For those of you who don't know her, I would encourage you to just simply look at her Twitter page to see how I think she uh, epitomizes two things. One is the zero tolerance to dissent and resistance in the new India. And secondly, the tenacity of resistance and protest, which she absolutely uh, embodies. So thank you so much, Kavita, for being here. A more formal introduction, Kavita is secretary of the All India Progressive Women's Association. She's a member of the Politburo of the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist, and an editor of its monthly publication, Liberation. She has a forthcoming book called Fearless Freedom, which will, the title itself will be familiar to a lot of us uh, a lot of you younger feminist activists in the room. Fearless Freedom deals with autonomy and the political economy of gendered governance. Kavita, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Srila. And uh, this looks like a wonderful uh, and important gathering uh, for two days, you know, uh, this, ability, this opportunity to be able to spend time with people from um, different continents and uh, really learn from each other. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, my, uh, you know, I was asked to speak about governing intimacies and I specifically wanted to look at how uh, the politics of gendered governance of uh, the Hindu supremacist far right in India um, meshes with other kinds of uh, governmentality as well as uh, other kinds of um, globalized governance of uh, uh, sexual and uh, gendered labor today in India. So I just wanted to look at how that kind of comes together because often I've found that when you speak to uh, people about India, you realize that the image that Indian government has today is quite different. And for a lot of people, it's about, oh, uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates have just given a, an award to, they've announced an award for the Indian prime minister because he's making toilets and toilets are important for women. And there are these progressive sounding campaigns of uh, educating daughters and uh, against sex selective abortion and for uh, uh, clean India against open defecation, etc., etc., and there's almost an attempt to construct a feminist image of this government, and uh, um, so that matches its slogans of globalized development and so on. But a closer look kind of look uh, sees how the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party and its parent organization, uh, the Sangh, uh, Rashtri Swayam Sevak Sangh, how their organized Islam Islamophobia and anti-feminism um, comes together with uh, the more general practices of uh, government campaigns in trying to actually coach and educate uh, certain kinds of, you know, they, they, they're trying to train people into certain kinds of gendered behavior. There's a word for this actually, which I've found um, used nowadays in op-ed pieces by uh, uh, ministers in the government and leaders of the ruling party, as well as <clears throat> other journalists who've, they're using the word nudge economics. So nudge economics is about uh, basically nudging people into changing their forms of behavior. Uh, changing the way, so it's supposed to be a more social kind of uh, economics, so it's more about coaching, training people how to, how to act. And, uh, <coughs> but what are those ways of acting? What are those ways of uh, behaving that are being taught and specifically taught, uh, you know, to women? Uh, that is something which I'd like to examine today. And I think that my feeling is that the po this politics kind of comes together as something which the Rashtri Swayam Sevak Sangh calls familyism, which they specifically pose as against feminism. So they, they talk about social harmony and they talk about familyism as their ideology as against feminism. So I, I want to take a closer look at this Beti Bachao campaign, which is the campaign which says save daughters and educate daughters. 
Um, it was supposed to, it was announced by the Prime Minister at an Independence Day speech uh, some years ago, and it was supposed to be a campaign against sex selective abortion uh, specifically. Uh, but what is the kind of messaging that has gone into it? Uh, quite recently, last year, in June last year, there was a photograph of a mural in Haryana that had come up against sex selection. So it had, it showed a picture of a little girl with her head covered, rolling out chapatis, rolling out rotis, and it said, Kaise khaoge unke haath ki rotiyan, jab paida hone nahi doge betiyan. So if you, how will you eat rotis made by their hands if you don't let daughters be born? So the idea that you deserve to have daughters, um, you are entitled to having daughters or daughters-in-law make these rotis for you as a labor of love. And uh, so, uh, and I've, I've seen, I, I can see some smiles in the room, but I, I know that a lot of people respond to this by thinking, but it's pragmatic. People think this way, and so this is the way to actually persuade them not to uh, uh, abort a uh, fetus that is likely to be born a girl. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, in, in terms of, I mean, it, needless to say, what has happened is I think, I'll, you know, the thing to emphasize here is that these campaigns have not worked. The sex ratio has not improved, uh, a, you know, in any very substantial way. And you have a whole range of these campaigns. So I think the thing to do is to look at what exactly they're doing. What are these campaigns doing? Um, they don't seem to be particularly effective in preventing sex selection or sex selective abortion, but what are they actually doing? So you have another campaign, other slogans which say, Beti nahi bachaoge to bahu kahan se laoge, which means if you don't save your daughters, where will you get daughters in law? And um, ma chahiye, behen chahiye, patni chahiye, to beti kyo nahi chahiye. If you, want, if you want a mother, if you want a sister, if you want a wife, then why don't you want a daughter? So it sounds very commonsensical and quite pragmatic and so on. But I, I uh, tried to go a little beyond to see where are these slogans actually emerging from. So one of the most popular campaigns that the Prime Minister had initiated was something called Selfie with Daughter, which was uh, encouraging people to sh take, uh, especially fathers, to take a photograph with their daughter and share it on social media. This campaign originated in a Haryana village with a, uh, a sarpanch of the Bibipur Panchayat in Haryana called Sunil Jaglan. And he um, uh, basically, uh, this, this campaign was then picked up by the Prime Minister who uh, propagated it on his Man Ki Baat radio show. And this um, person, the Sunil Jaglan, he runs in an organization called the Avivahit Purush Sangathan, the Unmarried Men's Organization. And this organization fights sex selection, not from the point of view of women's rights and emancipation, or even the right of women to be born and to live uh, on their own terms, but from the point of view of men who are entitled to wives and are deprived of them. So he complains, this uh, Sunil Jaglan, that Haryana has a drought of daughters and are forced to buy wives from other states. So he, in fact, uh, says that, you know, a couple of months ago, a family had purchased a bride from Uttarakhand. She ran away. They bought another one. She too ran away. So uh, the implication is that a woman who is uh, born and trained in the correct caste in Haryana and uh, then acquired in the traditional way through marriage, uh, traditional marriage, rather than by a cash purchase, will not run away. Because where would Haryana's own women run to, right? Where would the women of one's own community run to, right? Uh, so this organization then uh, had demanded that politicians remedy this situation and ensure a supply of bribes. And from that point of view, they had made this demand in the 2014 elections, uh, parliamentary elections, saying, Bahu dilao, vote pao. Give us, get us bribes and get our votes. So it was in response to such campaigns that you had a BJP leader, O.P. Dhankar, promising that uh, he is a good friend of the uh, person who is the Deputy Chief Minister of Bihar. And he had said that uh, if you make BJP strong, then these youths in the Haryana villages who are roaming without brides will get one. My good friend, uh, Sushil Modi, who is the uh, Deputy Chief Minister in Bihar, uh, he, he will ensure that uh, you can get you know, good brides from, good quality brides from Bihar. And more recently, you had the Haryana Chief Minister uh, Manohar Lal Khattar from the ruling BJP saying that um, there can be problems if the number of girls are lesser than boys, 
and our op dhankar ji had said that they we can bring brides from bihar and now some people say that kashmir is open and brides can be brought from there uh, of course he added that jokes apart you know if we get the sex ratio right then we will uh, have the right balance and we won't need to do all this but um so that statement of his says a lot of things about not only about the nature of these this campaign and the assumptions it's starting from but also about uh, you know the entire political economy of brides and what uh, what that's all about so you're looking at brides clearly uh, the assumption is there's no attempt at all to dislodge the idea that brides are a commodity which if they are in short supply can either be procured through purchase or through primitive accumulation you know as the spoils of war as in kashmir as from kashmir and so this argument for correcting the sex ratio is framed in terms of the entitlement of the patriarchal household to bridal labor not the right of autonomous women to exist so uh, and the the corollary of this is that this beti bachao slogan has many resonances it's saying many things in many different registers so one has to listen carefully to hear what is being said so while the official slogan is saying save your daughters uh, as in protect your daughters save your daughters let daughters be born but the other resonances and the other context in which the same slogan is used are those which tell parents that you have to save your daughter from marrying the wrong guy so you have to save your daughter specifically if you are a hindu parent then you should be saving your daughter from muslim men she should not fall in love with a muslim man and she should not marry a muslim man and so it's also linked with the whole idea that muslims are trying to uh in, um basically enhance their population and outgrow the outnumber hindus in india and all of that and it is not coincidentally uh the same slogan beti bachao uh, which was raised by the bjp and the sangh uh, in uh, muzaffarnagar which is it, uh, in western up uh before the 2014 elections um in uh, com organized communal violence against the muslim community there and communal violence that helped the uh, prime minister helped uh, mr modi get a whole uh, very large number of seats in that uh, part of uh, in that part of uttar pradesh in fact in the state of up and that slogan there was very clear there there was no attempt to disguise it it was very clear that you should save your daughters from muslim men in fact after the riots had happened after the violence had happened during the election campaign the bjp president in speeches that he made there addressing uh hindu fa hindu out families of various castes he specifically said that nobody likes to riot danga kaun karna chahta hai nobody likes to riot but people riot when uh, in order to protect the honor of their daughters and sisters so it was very clear that the very same slogan the saving of your daughter the saving of your sister the saving of women in of your community that is very much linked with and it, and and it should also be noted that that violence involved uh, rape of muslim women uh, and quite recently most of the accused in those uh, communal violence incidents have been acquitted and several of them uh, have at various times graced the uh, central ministry uh, the central government uh, cabinet of our government in the last 5 years so um then another campaign which i wanted to take a, a slightly closer look at was the swachh bharat campaign which is the clean india campaign which is basically the campaign against um against uh, open defecation so a recent um, editor you know uh, opinion piece by a leading journalist had noted that while previous governments had similar campaigns like nirmal bharat abhiyan under the upa and so on he specifically linked this campaign and its success uh, in whatever terms you look at that success but um success to this nudge economics the idea that you are asking people to own this campaign and the campaign is no longer looking only like a um, uh, top down campaign by the government okay so in a way uh, there is an outsourcing of the ownership of this campaign and the active participation in this campaign and there are many ways in which this campaign then overlaps with other projects of the ruling uh, formation and this is uh, this is obscured you need to look a little closer to actually see it happening but essentially i would say that it is a it goes hand in hand with the outsourcing of political violence of the outsourcing of violence by the state 
to the lynch mobs and so on. So it is a essentially, uh, and there have been many such incidents. So you have, okay, uh, so let's look, let's take a slightly uh, look, uh, let's take a look at the messaging of this campaign. So we are told that the toilets uh, are specifically wanted by women. So this is something which the messaging and the whole tenor of the campaign continuously harps on. So we are told that women and girls, uh, they even sell their Mangal Sutra, they sell their jewelry in order to build uh, toilets to protect them from the shame and the danger of open defecation. And so Swachh Bharat has been described, uh, even described by one uh, commentator as India's biggest women's movement at the moment. Um, so in his Independence Day speech at, in 2014, where uh, Modi announced this, he kept, uh, he said this specifically, that doesn't it pain you that our mothers and sisters have to defecate in the open? Isn't, it the, isn't the dignity of women our collective responsibility? And then you've had a series of campaigns basically talking about how open defecation puts women, women's honor and safety at risk. So you've had YouTube videos like this, you've had wall graffiti that says, uh, daughters-in-law and daughters should not go far, and so you construct a toilet in your house. You have a campaign led by Amitabh Bachchan, which says, shut the door. So, you know, the fact that a closed door uh, is something where, which means women don't have to go outside the house to defecate and all of that. And there's one Swachh Bharat uh, banner in Rajasthan where a daughter is asking her mother, that mother, uh, your veil is your companion in the home, so why do you then defecate in the open? So the, the clear linking of the, uh, of the toilet to the veil. This is there in multiple campaigns, many, many campaigns. And one poster in particular caught my attention, that there's a Swachh Bharat poster in Muzaffarpur, Bihar, that has the image of a man presenting a woman he has abducted to this villainous looking dacoit chief and saying, here boss, I've brought you this beautiful lote wali, uh, bearer, you know, of the mug of water from the field for you. And then this uh, dacoit says, all right, then it's rape time and all of that. So, um, the, so the, it's, it's clearly saying that you become vulnerable to sexual violence, you know, that open defecation uh, links, is linked to sexual violence. And if you are defecating in the open, it's an invitation to sexual violence. And so uh, toilets are important for your safety. Now, um, one thing is that, of course, a lot of women do s see the idea of, toil of, of toilets in the household as uh, it can be seen as, a, as, as convenient, especially if it has water and all of that. That's, that's a separate thing. But this business about safety and honor, uh, it is not really um, borne out by uh, experience. So in an in, at a meeting of my organization uh, in uh, Bihar, uh, I, uh, you know, some of us had asked about this and uh, we were, uh, so uh, this meeting was going on and so women uh, would get up in the early mornings and late evenings to go out en masse to relieve themselves. So they were asked, uh, so one of my friends there asked them, uh, wouldn't you prefer to have toilets in your home so that you wouldn't have to go out? So they scoffed at this and they said, Didi, why give them, that is our men folk and the in-laws, another reason to keep us captive indoors. This is our only excuse to go for a walk and to spend time together. So you're going to take that away. So, uh, and the, because that's where we can talk to friends without anybody overhearing us. And this is something which a sanitation uh, quality use access and trends report called the Squat Survey in 2014 also found. They also spoke to young women in Haryana who said exactly the same thing. Saying we are cooped up indoors and that's our morning walk and you're taking that away. Now the point is that suppose there were toilets inside and women were to go for these morning walks anyway. Suppose that were okay to do. Uh, then would the government be saying you will be raped if you go for a walk? You will be raped if you go outside? That is the problem actually with linking sexual violence with this. And there's another kind of um, basically uh, a structuring of, uh, uh, you know, structure. There is an attempt to coach you to respond in a certain way. There's an attempt to coach women into saying that you must want, want toilets for safety. You must want uh, you must you must demand toilets as part of you know during your marriage and all of that because that is good behavior that is uh, civilized behavior and all of that and it is important uh, as in uh, it's as important to you as your veil and all of that so uh, there's a very definite attempt to do this kind of uh, combination of scaremongering as well as uh, nudging towards particular kinds of gendered behavior 
and it's a very indian irony that the swachh bharat abhiyan that tells women that they will be uh, vulnerable to open defecation uh, vulnerable to voyeurism and sexual violence if they defecate in the open is a campaign that has unleashed government sponsored mob voyeurism and violence against those women so there are multiple instances of these and in fact it is actively encouraged so you have booklets campaign booklets with voyeuristic drawings showing uh, women's private parts uh, when they're defecating in the open and saying see this is what will happen everybody will be able to look at you and then the, it encourages uh, so monitoring there you have the sanitation patrols so sat sanitation monitoring committees in the village which are encouraged to behave like vigilante mobs patrolling the villages and whistling at people defecating in the open and taking photographs and videos of open defecators with the threat that we will upload these online and all of that and specifically when these are targeted at women india has laws against voyeurism you're not supposed to i mean in in actual fact uh, you're not supposed to be uh, it is a, it is a crime to be taking a photograph or a video of a woman during a private act but the whole idea is that because this private act of defecation is happening in public then you deserve this and so you have to be um, and in in actual fact there have been mobs which uh, have actually killed a man who uh, who joined um, muslim women in uh, pratapgarh in rajasthan to try and resist this to stand up you know he he went he went forward when the women were resisting this attempt to videograph them and he stood up for them and he was a muslim man and he was a comrade uh, a, a communist activist of my party and he was surrounded by the mob and uh, beaten up and he died of the beating so i think that there is this overlap between the vigilante mobs and the uh, the attempt to organize this kind of vigilante mob uh, moral policing along with as an adjunct of a campaign that is pushing for open defecation and trying to nudge people into changing their behavior so it's not so much nudge as um push and shove and threaten and all of that um i think most dangerously uh, i don't know if i don't know how many of you heard the uh, independence day speech this year that the prime minister gave this year and i think that the signals in that speech are probably the most chilling to those of us who uh, you know are uh, i did i happened to be on a radio show and i was asked to uh it was a it was a radio show for a, a for some international radio um app and so they asked me to do i was unprepared for it they asked me to do a simultaneous sort of translation of his speech so i had to suffer through that i did that and i when while doing that i literally got goosebumps because i heard him you know out of fear because i heard him say uh announce this campaign of population control the population control of course has all kinds of uh, resonances in india not least being during the emergency the attempt to forcibly um uh, sterilize indian men and that became one of the big factors in uh, you know the 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 uprising you know the the anger against the emergency let's put it that way but it's also a fact that because that was a campaign of to sterilize men campaigns to sterilize women have a whole lot of sanction not only from the state in india before prior to the bjp and also from international funding agencies so um uh, it's it's important to kind of look at the various subtexts of this campaign so apart from the gendered subtext which i'll go into in a minute i should also quickly point out that population control is also very closely linked in the bjp's and the sang parivar's vocabulary with uh, basically genocidal intent towards muslims so the idea that muslims are reproducing too much and they should be prevented from reproducing and um how this all comes together it comes together as a project of uh, of of controlling women's behavior as well as controlling muslim behavior so controlling women's sexuality and muslim sexuality women's reproduction and muslim reproduction together so let's look at how this happens i uh, you know i was translating his speech uh, modi's speech so he called for a campaign against what he called uncontrolled population growth and he said that the campaign should focus on projecting parents with small families as responsible and patriotic and he said before a child arrives into our family we should think have i prepared myself to fulfill the needs of this child or will i leave it dependent on society 
So this rhetoric clearly shifts the responsibility for care, for education, health, food, shelter, etc., of children from the state to the parents. And so you have this, uh, you know, deprivation is framed as a parental neglect and irresponsibility. And the Malthusian axiom is invoked here that it is poor families and poor nations that are expected to reproduce less. And um, for a very long time, population control policies of government of India were backed, you know, backed by international funding agencies have resulted in extreme violence towards poor women in India. Um, between 2009 and 2012, 15 women died every month due to botched sterilization operations in uh, mass sterilization camps. Invariably, these were women from oppressed castes and especially from scheduled tribes. And um, now, of course, this population control campaign is likely to again, uh, un, you know, unle this, this, this became quite controversial and there were court judgments, you know, saying you cannot set targets for sterilization, you can't hold mass sterilization camps and all of that. But this camp, population control campaign is likely again to became, become a campaign for the control of uh, the board. We had a member of the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights participating in that, um, in that meeting. And so she was on the panel and various women were giving testimonies about uh, what they had faced when they had babies, how they uh, were not allowed to go back to work, how they were not allowed to access mater, uh, you know, materni maternity entitlements that they were supposed to get and all of that. So while this one of these women was speaking, uh, this woman suddenly stopped her and rapped out, mm, uh, so how many babies do you have? So how many children do you have? Was this uh, your baby, was, uh, it was your second? So the woman said, no, my third. And so immediately she said, haven't you heard that you're not supposed to have so many children? You're supposed to space them out? This, and then she gave this entire lecture on how women are responsible for spacing out their babies. And, and it was quite awful, actually. And of course, then uh, people from the, the <laughs> because it was a quite a, you know, it was a, it was a gathering which, uh, you know, with, with a lot of feminists in it. And so they stood up and made a noise. Or we, we stood up and made a noise. But she didn't get it, actually, because she, she you know, the whole idea was that this was the right thing to do to tell women that, uh, wag a finger at them and tell them that you're not supposed to be having so many babies was perfectly all right. So that kind of public shaming is also going to get a lot of boost. And um, then the, um, the anti-Muslim subtext of this is also impossible to miss. Because in, uh, in Gujarat 2002, Narendra Modi himself had infamously called the relief camps for the pogrom affected Muslims as baby producing factories. Last month, on Jul uh, 11 July 2019, last month, uh, no, a month before last, uh, Modi's cabinet minister, Giriraj Singh, he addressed a rally in Delhi, uh, and uh, he, this happened to be 11 July's World Population Day. So this Giriraj Singh, he demanded a population control lo law. And at that rally, there was a song playing from the dais, which said, Jan Sankhya visport se apni azadi ko khatra hai, humko gaddaaron ki badhti abadi se khatra hai. Our independence is in danger from the population explosion, and we are in danger from the rising population of traitors. Traitors, code for Muslims. It isn't even code, it's fairly obvious. And so this minister at that rally called for a law to prevent the decline in the population of Hindus and curb the growth of Muslim population. So he didn't uh, mince his words at all, you know, it was quite open. And participants in this rally branded Muslims as unpatriotic and irresponsible for bearing too many children. One of them said that, oh, these people are poor and even if they work at cobblers and they repair cycle punctures, they still insist on having babies. You know? so, and this lines up with what Modi was saying, that if you're poor, then if you can't afford to have a child, then don't have a child. You shouldn't be bearing those children if you can't take care of them. And um, also, of course, this whole thing is uh, linked to the myth that Muslims, uh, the love jihad myth, that Muslims marry Hindu women in order to increase the population of Muslims. Um, quite apart from these government campaigns, there are also other, other, other campaigns which also tie up with, uh, you know, sort of training women about how to think about their own labor uh, in and outside the household. So you have these uh, microfinance institutions and the self-help groups which are often projected as being that these are the neutral institutions which are there for the empowerment of women. And very often, uh, one of the only things the government will say they're doing for empowerment is to say uh, that we are, set, we are helping to set up the self-help groups and we are you know, helping self-help groups to be set up. Now, the thing is that, um, so you, uh, 
even the even the uh, campaigns for self help groups where the uh, how are, how are bureaucrats and how are people in governance talking about self help groups so you have senior district bureaucrats in gujarat explaining that women make good debtors that you know they they are unlike ma men who are bad debtors women make good debtors because men can disappear for many days but women can't go anywhere they can be located very easily they cannot run away they cannot leave their homes and they can be persuaded to repay easily since they feel shame more quickly and consider non payment as a betrayal of family honor so all that uh, entire ideological uh, structure of shame and honor and the lack of mobility and lack of autonomy is something that is being uh, uh, reinforced by the campaign to set up self help groups and so on and in fact you've had people um, uh, 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 one of these uh, government services which uh, which bo boosts shg projects officials running that project monitoring these schemes they say that oh women sit idle at home or they sleep in their houses idly all the time and so self help groups will provide them with work so that they too can contribute to their families so the idea that women are basically you know that uh, household work is not work at all and they are just idling away at home and also they are actively discouraged from going into any discussion about women's unequal social economic status uh there's a world bank funded swashakti shg group and uh, somebody monitoring that an official monitoring that said if we start teaching those things then our whole society will collapse and we will have no values and culture left whatever we do we should not destroy our family system so these ideas about family and harmony uh these are there of course in the government led campaigns but there are many ways in which they dovetail with the ideology of the rashtriya swayamsevak sang so the journalist neha dikshit when she visited a camp of the rss's women's wing the rashtra sevika samiti uh, she found that uh, they specifically said we are not feminists we are familyists and they said that uh, we do not fight for women's rights uh, they specifically said that that's not us we don't do that and um, uh, so the way in which the idea of the family is imagined by the sang and by the bjp is interesting to look at because essentially it's an hierarchy gendered hierarchy as well as caste hierarchy and this gendered and caste hierarchy is reinforced through uh, the sang's own propaganda as well as through these government schemes and so on which also a more generally uh, you know sort of tie in with these campaigns so there's a selection of speeches by uh, mr modi called samra samajik samrasta uh, which is about social harmony so this is the basically the rss tenet of social harmony and the idea here is that uh, the book actually claims that ambedkar did not seek to wage war on caste and make a break with the hindu religion but he wanted to unite hindu society and so uh, you know he didn't want to annihilate caste or anything like that he just wanted to unify the hindus and very interestingly in this uh, in one of his speeches which is compiled in this book modi claims that ambedkar addressing 20000 dalit women at the convention of federation of scheduled castes in 1942 told them you are the lakshmi of the house you have to be cautious that nothing unfortunate befalls the household where did he find this reference i scoured ambedkar and could not find any reference to the lakshmi of the house i found quite a lot he's written against all the hindu gods and goddesses but nothing referring to the lakshmi of the house and so this doesn't seem to be ambedkar of the collected works of bhimrao ambedkar this seems to be the ambedkar dreamed up by modi in manu's or the rss's image and modi actually says this he continuously compares ambedkar uh, as the maker of the constitution as the lawgiver to manu the lawgiver repeatedly and um in actual in actual fact of course uh, ambedkar wrote and spoke extensively on women and gender and uh, he's asked them never to be slaves to their husband he's asked them to be concerned about maternal health he's asked them to adopt family planning he uh, excoriates the hindu brahmanical order that makes the women gateways to the castes and polices those gateways rigidly and he pushed the hindu code bill in the teeth of orthodox opposition but modi makes him an ambedkar who's repeating these corny lines from hindi cinema about ghar ki lakshmi and uh, all this is to say that basically social harmony of the sang uh, disguises inequalities as harmony and then it uses these soothing phrases assuring the oppressed of their divinity that you are lakshmi and you are whatever and uh, also it keeps using the uh, the word uh, home right so ghar uh, and parivar 
So ghar is used in many, many contexts. Uh, the home is used in, so ghar vapsi is for the, those who have uh, converted out of Hinduism to convert back into, uh, in the, into um, and now with the citizenship amendment bill, uh, you're having the BJP campaign that India is the home, the ghar for Hindus internationally. It is the, uh, you, so Hindus everywhere have a right to return home to India. So it's like the right to return that Israel um, believes in. So it's the same value here. So um, at the end of it, uh, I just want to uh, say before I open it up for questions is that, uh, so you're having this, a lot of the campaigns that we are witnessing now are from the government and from the ruling party in India today are uh, heavily focused with uh, uh, focused on building certain images of women. So the idea of uh, mothering also figures in a big way, the idea of family figures in a big way, the household figures in a big way. Even when it comes to industries, the BJP's manifesto says industry family. So of course, if it's an industry family, you don't need labor laws and all of that to regulate that. It's going to be the benign employer uh, taking care of the employees who are in, um, in, their, uh, in their care. So it's a care, it's a benign paternalistic caregiving rather than a relationship, a contract of any kind. And uh, also you have uh, the image, invoking of the images of Bharat Mata, so Mother India and Gau Mata, the mother cow and all of that. So this, uh, and uh, Bharat Mata and Gau Mata and all are often excuses for, the pretext for unleashing violence against um, Muslims, both Muslim men and women in many ways. So I've also been sort of toying with the idea, thinking about how a feminist politics of parenting or a feminist politics of mothering would look like in uh, response to these. And what are the uh, examples we have around us or we have in our history that we should be actually thinking about and resurrecting in this context. And I'll just leave you with that, with my thoughts on that, because I think about you know, Radhika Vemula or I think about F uh, Fatima Nafis who are dealing with the very real uh, sense of love and loss of a child. And um, the way in which that becomes something which they turn into a, uh, a, a form of politics, a form of resistance, is something which is looking at mothering and looking at parenting in a very different way. And you have many, many other instances of it. So I look at Chandrapati of Haryana who has been fighting for justice for her son Manoj who was killed by his in-laws because he married a woman of the same Gotra. So Manoj and his uh, wife Babli were both uh, killed because they were uh, the same, uh, same Gotra couple. And Neelam Katara, uh, whose son was killed, uh, has become, you know, in a, um, uh, by, by uh, the brothers of his girlfriend. Neelam Katara has turned into a campaigner against caste patriarchal crimes, against love. Uh, you can think of, in, if you go farther back, then you can think of Satyarani Chadha and uh, Shah Jahan Appa, both who were mothers of dowry burning victims, and they both became feminist sisters in struggle, and they led the anti-dowry movement. Um, so that was also, you know, and that, so everywhere you would see these mothers going with a photograph of their daughter. So the idea of mothering being uh, something quite different from this, this abstract mo notion of a mother flattened out of any contradictions and any uh, real emotion or love, but uh, just as a flat image, which is an excuse, which so is a mother of sons, that Bharat Mata is always the mother of sons, who must avenge her by unleashing violence against uh, some other or some enemy. So this is very different, I find. And you find it, of course, in, in fathers as well. So I think of Prof uh, Professor T.V. Icharavarir, who hunted for his son Rajan, who was disappeared, tortured, and killed during the emergency. And he has written this entire book about that, his search for his son, his search to find out what happened to his son. And it's an absolutely gut-wrenching narrative of uh, a disappearance and what that does to a parent. And uh, then more recently, I, 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 read an account, I read a journalistic accounts of Buddheshwar, the father of Meena Khalko. Meena Khalko was a teenager who was gang raped and killed by, by the forces in Chhattisgarh, who later claimed it was an encounter and she was a Naxal uh, militant. And in, uh, you had Chhattisgarh ministers shaming Meena Khalko, uh, saying that, oh, she, was, she had a boyfriend. She used to go out to meet somebody. She used to go out on a cycle and hang out in the evenings with a, 
uh, man who used to drive a truck. And so this was used to say that she basically was a prostitute who used to service the truck drivers and all of that. All that was used against her. And you, uh, you had Buddheshwar speaking to a journalist and saying that my heart used to be this big and now it's this small. And he said, Hamri dil ko bohut karta hai. hurts my heart a lot. So I think of this very real hurt and pain, uh, a human hurt and pain of, of human real, sort of real life parents as being something maybe which uh, can stand up to this, um, the violence of the abstract mothers that we are confronted with continuously. You have the mothers of Manipur, of course, who had stripped to protest the gang rape and custodial killing of Tanjam Manorama. You have, you have Parvina Hangar and the parents of the disappeared in Kashmir. So I feel that these parents offer us a politics which restores the humanity and the pain to motherhood and parenting. And so I, I feel that um, in, the, in these abstractions about family, in all this rhetoric about family and how women are supposed to behave and how uh, daughters are supposed to behave and how daughters-in-law are supposed to behave and the good daughter who should be born and the bad daughter who should be killed and the, uh, the, the wrong uh, kinds of uh, lovers who, should be, who, who don't deserve to live and all of this that we are confronted with and it seems to be gaining in momentum all the time. There, um, you know, these are my thoughts about how to kind of resurrect a feminist politics of, uh, of, uh, of parenting and of uh, um, filial and familial relationships, if you call it that. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. Um, we have time for at least one round of questions, thoughts, comments. Um, I can, I mean, we can take, yeah. if there's time, we can take another round. Yeah, take round. another. Oh, you want to take another round? Maybe just let her. Oh, answer. okay, one, one more question, and then we can take another round if there's time. Uh, yeah, so I'll try and quickly answer what you said. See, I think uh, what you're saying, women uh, and uh, women who are in households who may not be wage earners, what they feel, I think it's a little different from what, uh, what I'm saying about the government campaigns. 
when you say that women think they're doing something great, they are doing something great, absolutely. I mean, that is not the problem. I think uh, uh, to see that as valuable, to see what they're doing as valuable, as their labor as valuable, that is not the problem. I think the problem lies in the ideological notions that women must do nothing else and that women must be subjugated uh, and do, um, you know, and schooled in certain ways and subjected to certain forms of restrictions and violence and all of that, right? So that is, after all, something that is being challenged. It's not just uh, me or people in this room who are challenging it, right? There is actually a women's movement in India and has been for a very long time where you're having women in rural India, the same women who may be either waged workers or unwaged, uh, you know, uh, women who are working inside the home who are actually challenging this, right? And they're saying that we don't want to face violence or we want... Uh, certain kinds of wages or we don't want to be treated in a certain manner against dowry burnings and dowry killings for instance. These were not women who'd done a course in feminism somewhere who'd led this struggle, right? So I think that in society you'll always have different kinds of strands but the I, I, I would say the important thing is to actually recognize uh, that these are valid strands. What There's an attempt today in today's India that links up with your question to say that these are all invalid. Anybody who's talking this language is essentially Western inspired and is all, this is all Western liberal ideas and these are not uh, Indian, these are not Indian enough. So I think the challenge is to assert that no, absolutely not. These are going to be there as long as there are you know, human beings in the world, the urge to be free, the urge to want uh, freedom and the urge to want autonomy is a human urge. Everybody is going to feel it. Of course women will feel it and they're going to find their own idiom and ways of expressing it, right? So um, what you asked kind of ties up with that. So I'll just quickly touch upon that. Not much to say about that. I think that what you're, wit what you're witnessing a little bit of is the organized uh, far-right presence on social media. So that is pretty organized and uh, quite uh, quite aggressive and is right now you're getting a little more of it because they've suddenly remembered I exist also because of the Kashmir uh, visit recently. So they, there's a little extra attention because of that. But in general, there is an attempt to discredit um, and paint a certain picture of Indian feminists, all Indian feminists. So the idea is to paint a picture of Indian feminists as being... Um, you know, sort of ugly and, uh, of course, ugly and unrapeable, and yet they should be raped to be punished, and of course they are against our family values and all of that. So there is an attempt to do this, uh, which is quite quite deliberate and uh, functions in a lot of ways. And I think a lot very similar things are happening, I believe, even in Brazil. Of what I heard from friends in Brazil is that very, very similar things to try and discredit feminist activism and all of that. Uh, what... Uh, you said about Chile, yes, I'm very much aware of that, and I do think that that politics of the mothers of the disappeared in several of the Latin American countries and all of that, definitely that is something that has inspired similar activism here as well. Um, how we are responding to it, it's not just women in you know my party or organization, but I think that a lot of uh, women's uh, movement groups are trying to respond to this in different ways. Uh, uh, in a way, it's peculiar because at one level, uh, India is at a moment where in the past some years, you've had some kind of unprecedented organizing and activism also, which has precisely asserted women's autonomy, which has put autonomy front and center, rather than violence and safety front and center. It has put autonomy front and center. And that has been both uh, social media campaigns as well as campaigns of urban you know, women students in uh, campuses and all of that. And that continues as well as uh, women laborers and uh, you know for instance sanitation workers even the work even the uh, women i mentioned about uh, so they've been quite um, active organizing against the swachh bharat uh, violence in bihar where women have actually organized and fought back and really done battle with these uh, moral policing these vigilante mobs saying uh, what on earth uh, you come to my house and try and use the toilet that the government is asking me to use I can't use that, it doesn't have water, it doesn't have, uh, you know, it is not dignified for me to use it. And, uh, you know, so uh, w if you want me to clean pits because I'm a Dalit woman, then uh, you show me where the elected representatives are cleaning the pit toilets. You let them clean the pit toilets also. That kind of thing, so that they, they, uh, they have fought back and bringing caste and bringing autonomy and uh, those questions in the center. 
Uh, thank you so much, Kavita. I think we're going to move uh, straight into the next keynote. I just wanted to, um, just to say on, on the side, and since you evoked the maternal, that one of many of Kavita's classic responses to trolls was, I can't remember when, when she was accused of having free sex. And, and, and that she and her mother uh, were accused of having free sex. And Kavita's mother actually intervened on social media to say, yes, I did have free sex, and I hope you did too. <laughs> So uh, again, perhaps uh, embodying the, the mother-daughter resistant values that we need for the moment. Thank you so much.